Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with the man that made Tomahawk's EDCs again, Zach Wingard of Wingard Wearables. Zach is a perennial favorite for me as a show host and as a collector of instruments of chaos, a loose term I give knife-adjacent weapons and tools. Zach has designed some of the most imaginative, practical, and deadly EDC tools, bridging modern-day needs with old-world solutions. He knows history, he knows weapons, and a lot of other interesting stuff, and it's always a pleasure to talk with him about what he's just cooked up. We'll talk all about it, but first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and share the show. Also, if you want to help support the show, you can do that at thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Adventure Delivered your monthly subscription for hand-picked outdoor, survival, EDC, and other cool gear from our expert team of outdoor professionals. TheKnifeJunkie.com slash BattleBox. Zach, welcome back to the show. It's always a pleasure to see you, sir. Hola, Bob and Knife Junkies. It's fantastic to be great. Great to be back. So uh, we bring you on the show periodically, A, because I just think you're fun to talk with, uh, but also you you go into deep R&D on a new project, and then you emerge with something super cool, and you have a new product this season. We're going to talk about it in a minute, but uh, before we get to that, I want to congratulate you on uh, your first Blade show. Yeah, we survived. That was something. Uh, never done uh, any show like that before, only local knife shows um but then going to blade i mean the scale of it people have been telling us you gotta go to blade show um and yeah it was lots of prep it was a, a ton of work but it was pretty amazing I, I had a very special experience definitely meeting like so many people like first time meeting you face to face yeah um and and just it was fantastic i mean i walked in the baller room as it's called and saw your um booth from well uh, from the entrance uh so from across a crowded room you could say and uh that big empress tomahawk uh over your over your, this empress tomahawk over your display and then you had all of those uh designs um uh sketchbook drawings kind of like the da vinci's notebooks of your different projects kind of showing the development of them and the drawings and the ideas um what was it like going through all that stuff to set that up Oh, gosh. I mean, that was one of the things we had done, um, a local knife show, Lehigh Valley Knife Show in uh, Easton, PA, and observed, you know, the tables that were there in our own table. And we knew if Blade Show was many times larger that we had to do something really distinctive to grab people's attention so that when you're surveying the room with, with just so many tables that we'd be able to stand out. Um, so... You know, the wife and I were, were huddled together thinking and we're like, well, what do we do? And uh, the thought was, hey, just make a giant tomahawk and have it above the table suspended over our heads. And um, I was like, oh, that sounds like a good idea. But that sounds like a lot of work. Um, and amazingly, my wife pulled it off. She probably spent 20 to 30 hours making this uh you know, giant Empress Tomahawk that was eight feet long, uh, made a polystyrene, like construction grade. And so, you know, I, I helped her with some aspects of the design so that it could come together, but our car is, is not large enough to accommodate that. So it had to be, you know, it was polystyrene, which is, you know, fragile. It had to be disassemblable and, and you know, man carried up down escalators and stuff. And so it was just quite an ordeal, but we, we, put it together it worked it looked like a giant empress tom it was beautiful it, it, it went over our heads and then it was like okay we got this grand uh you know display above our heads what do we do on the table like yeah because one of the things that's that's really common that we had done in a previous show was um black tablecloth i know this is gonna sound super uh boring to most people i think oh black tablecloth you know but one of the things I noticed, like in our previous experiences, is like you got crumbs and 
you know, dandruff and stuff it just floats around and it lands on the table and like it, it's super contrast on a black table. Oh, so yeah. you're constantly like, you know, trying to clean up, you know, the table, uh, you know, because you got these beautiful weapons on this black tablecloth and then there's these little specks and you don't know if it's like something gross like dead skin <laughs> or, you know if it was like me with like a leftover bit of donut you know yeah, flying out yeah. and, and so uh it was like gosh how do we you know make it look clean and not have to manage you know this thing and, and be distinctive and so i have just all my designs that we go through they all start with hand sketches like iteration after iteration after iteration a lot of them are on engineering paper you know sort of grid paper mm -hmm. um, and these go back to you know 2016 and our business launched in 2018 so there was often like years of drawings you know from 2016 to now so you're talking gosh like eight years of hand sketches and mm -hmm. so the idea popped in my head like what if we just do uh you know, a display where it's our products on a clear piece of translucent plastic. And then underneath it is like a collage of what we've already done. Like it's already, you just got to go through and pick the right sketches and drawings and lay them out and your display is finished. And one of the advantages, we weren't clever enough to think the through, but then when I, I saw it, like, again, there was lots of like crumbs and stuff and, you know, sweat you know, dripping and everything, you know, because there's hundreds of people going by. You just don't want to yeah, think about yeah. this stuff. But when it's a, a collage of colors and things, it just blends it away. Yeah. It's like it's like when you dim yeah. the lights at a fancy restaurant, you can't see the roaches crawling, you know, and right. stain on the waiters, you know, apron and stuff. So we were really, uh, you know, it was one of those things like, oh, man, that really worked out because like, I, you know, it made the table look neat because it was already so messy in how many drawings and things there were, how, how cluttered it was. But we did have people like tell us like, hey, I hadn't seen a table, anything like that. It was. Yes. Neat. And we were able to reference like when we were telling talking through our designs we were able to like lift up a back ripper and point to the design iterations we actually had all the pictures you know of the hand drawings we went through where we thought we knew what we we're doing and we were wrong we had to iterate you know hmm. so it was nice to be able to like tell a story with the drawing so it wasn't just decoration you know and it also showed you know the work that you, you did uh, it wasn't just a cool looking implement on the table it, it told the whole story which is something that we wanted to, you know, go into Blade Show, you know, show the, what our brand's about is just thinking through tough problems that people didn't really ask us to solve, but it's like, hey, you got to obsess about it, you know? Yeah. And so that degree of obsession was very evident. Uh, I don't know, like some people, you know, you know, got turned off by seeing a giant tomahawk and stuff, and so they didn't come to the table, and that works by us because who who would want to engage such boring people, right? Um, versus <laughs> yeah. the people that see the giant tomahawk and they see all the, the drawings and stuff, they're like, "Oh yeah, I gotta check this out." Well, that's our yeah. kind of people. That uh, the way you had it set up. I mean, uh, most people, many people, uh, definitely people who listen to this show, like to peek behind the curtain and see how stuff is made, see where it comes from, see. What the motivation was i mean that's to me as i get older and older uh that's what's most interesting to me about things and people it's just I, well how and why did it get here and like uh what led to this and and that's why i you know i i offhandedly mentioned da vinci's notebooks but i love artist sketchbooks and i love seeing in, in artists uh, studios uh and that kind of thing and see where where the where the sausage is made, so to speak. And so to have that all out there, it was like a full on experience, uh, you know, to see, and then to be able to pick up the, uh, pick up the implements. Uh, yes. So how, how are you received? I think we were told there was no table like it at Blade Show. Uh, we heard that cool. repeatedly. And since there are like, what, a thousand exhibitors at Blade, um, I would say job well done on being distinctive. One of the problems with being distinctive, though, is that you have to tell the whole story. And so, um, hmm. you know, if people see things like quills and dick pics and our tomahawks and that sort of thing, they're like, well, what are these things? You know, they hadn't seen anything like, you know, the micropike multi-tool and that sort of thing. Well, you had to explain it all. And so um, if someone came in and was interested, you know, basically at the end of every day, I lost my voice um because you were just talking you know um and so that was 
you know, it's kind of baked in the cake if you're going to do distinctive designs that aren't necessarily like, especially something that's unfamiliar, like the, the micro pipe, you're going to have to explain what that is, what that capability buys them, like what's the purpose and thought process behind the design. And when you're engaging hundreds of people a day, the voice box can't oh, do it. Yeah. Um, like I uh, was even told ahead of time, like you're going to lose your voice at Blake because it's like three days of show. And then afterwards you got the pit you know, where you're supposed to like do the networking and be social. And, and I'm like struggling on the introvert extrovert scale, but like, you know, that was just too much, too many people to talk to, you know, really uh, having to explain, you know, over and over again. And it wasn't, that it was monotonous. It was just the wear and tear on your vocal cords. It took me probably uh, two weeks to really get my voice to return where it didn't sound horrible. Um, so that was like a challenge, um, but it was never a point where I, I couldn't actually talk, you know, it, it didn't get that bad. Um, but yeah, I think we were, it, it went okay. You know, sales, I think were on the lower end of expectations with talking to other people at the show. They were saying, you know, people that have been exhibiting that blade for years. Like I wouldn't like prompt them like, Hey, you're having a bad show or anything, but I'd be like, Hey, how was your day at blade? And they were like, this is the first slow Saturday I've ever seen. And these are mm -hmm. guys that have been exhibiting for years. So I do think there are some like macro economic pressures, you know, it's never been more expensive to live in America yeah. um, that are starting to rein in on uh, purchases that are not, you know, food on the table. Or, you know, if you got to prioritize your family's vacation, you know, your wife would use one of these implements on you if you, know, <laughs> yeah. you blew the family's vacation budget on it, you know. Um, so I think there was a little bit of that that seemed to happen, but we were thrilled with it. You know, it was definitely the best tabletop show we've ever done. And we intend to be back next year. I'm just going to pack more, um, what do you call it, you know, throat lozenges, you know. Oh, yes, and yes. You know, I also got like a, a voice steamer. Have you guys heard of that? You put it on your face. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. So like an opera I, I, singer. Yeah. So, yeah, they use that, don't they? Yeah, I think so, yeah. 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 So I looked up like ahead of time. I was doing my homework. I'm like, how do I keep my voice? You know, because I was losing my voice at the local knife shows, you know, and I'm like, gosh, you know, they had a fraction of the attendees. So I was on that voice steamer thing, which is not, you know, my poor wife, you know, we're in the small hotel room. I have this thing on my face. And it's like, <laughs> it's not like that. Uh, was it? There was a Mad Max remake where the villain has a evil looking mask. Oh, not, you know, not quite lame. that. <laughs> no, it looked lame. It was like purple plastic and like, uh, you're holding this thing. Like I definitely lost some husband capital, but it, it, <laughs> it helped with the voice, you know? So uh, we, uh, we had a great conversation. You well, I I came to your uh, table a couple of times, but uh, the last time, uh, Fred Perrin was there, and I'm a I, I have a man. He's so cool. I love that guy. And um, Fred Perrin, if you don't know who he is, he's like a a famed retired French commando, basically turned knife maker, and he's and and country gentleman. I think is <laughs> I think that's part of what he yeah, just kind of lives out in the country, walks his dogs, makes knives, and that kind of thing. Uh, but it was cool talking with him and you at the same time because both of you have unconventional approaches. Uh, before we get into the the new Sparrow Hawk, if someone is listening uh, to this conversation for the first time, uh, and I'm sure your elevator pitch was honed from that Blade Show experience, <laughs> but uh, what what is the approach that the unique approach that Wingard Wearables takes to its product design? If you can imagine a handheld tool, an implement that gets you a unique capability that isn't already addressed on the market and you can wear it on your person, that's what it's all about. You know, even if it's as simple as like a spike uh, tool, um, adapting that so it can be gripped in different ways in your hand or worn on your body, or if something as large as like a tomahawk, you know, or a large knife, you know, that you can carry on your body, like taking a look at what's at the market and what capabilities there are and then what capabilities are lacking and trying to figure out those problems. And really, when it comes to ergonomics, a lot of our products mostly have been on the larger side. Like, how do you get a large fixed blade knife worn on the body or, you know, a compact spear? You know, these are like challenging problems. 
but they're very niche. You know, not many people are like looking for that sort of thing. So, so far our brand has been focused on these really niche problems where we're starting to expand into smaller implements you've seen are like small spike tools. Uh, and we're also thinking of getting into small fixed blades and going to Fred Perrin, he's like the king of small fixed blade yes. knife designs and he also makes spikes too and so it was great to see him because i can remember being a freshman in college finally having like ethernet cable access and instead of you know looking up things that a lot of college kids probably did look up you know back then on the internet i was like <laughs> looking up knives and fred parent was on my radar then so that was gosh in 20 2002 you know, he had the LeGriff and some other mm -hmm. distinctive small fixed blades. And so I've been following his work for, you know, 22 years. You're never going to meet him except that blade if you're, you know, a kid from, you know, I was in Tennessee at the time. Uh, but yeah, it was it was great to meet him. Uh, we had been following each other on Instagram. He had actually uh, sent me a, a gift like in the mail, like a gift package like a couple of years ago. Wow. It was like an open L uh, number eight that he had modified to be like flippable. Well, he made a antler tying impact tool that was kind of shaped like the quill. And um, also it was like a ring talon knife that was like a mid tech type production, but he didn't have to do that. You know, sending those to me, it was yeah. incredible. And I was like, well, I want to meet him at blade. I want to get, return the favor. And uh, you know, he picked out a uh, quill, uh, oh, cool. you know, and so, I was really honored to meet him. He came by the table twice. Yep. He got a slint, a small black quill. And yeah, talking to him the second time he came by, you came by as well. And yeah, just the, the t I guess you call it tactical wisdom and perspective he had was just so yeah. interesting, you know, especially like talking about small spikes and, you know, using those and like ground fighting and that sort of thing. It was just yeah. really amazing to get you know, his energy and, and his presence, but also just the knowledge that he was laying out was great. It was. I mean, his point about spikes. Uh, well, first of all, he he did a very cool move. Uh, you know, you go where your head goes. He has a really thick French accent. He steps on my foot and gently but firmly <laughs> turns my head. And, you know, uh, and it was just cool to be. I don't know. I've been thrown around by some of the best. <laughs> it was yeah. cool to have Fred Perrin lay hands. Uh, but what I was going to say is his point about the spike uh, defensively um, is that it doesn't produce a lot of mess, a lot of blood. If you have to stick someone with it, basically, it's very effective and it gives you time to get away. It doesn't make a huge mess. And, yeah, he, he was very illustrative in telling me that. But I thought that was very cool. It was also just, I think, spikes being so thin you can wear them or conceal them in some ways easier. Like mm -hmm. he was uh, even talking about, you know, tucking, um, you know, a spike in the shoe, you know, on accessing it, yeah. you know, grabbing the heel of your shoe, you know, to access it, to index it if you were on the ground. Uh, so it was just, it was interesting. So it was thought provoking. I'm not saying we're going to come out with like a shoe spike <laughs> or something. We have thought about that. I didn't want to put that <laughs> on the table. Like I edited so much of what we put on the table. Like there's so many crazy ideas we've had that are never going to see the light of day. But uh, shoe spikes, that's not coming out anytime soon. Well, it's like back in the old days of film photography. You had 36 exposures, 32. And uh, if you were serious about photography, you could count on one good frame out of those. So that's, that's probably a lot how product design goes and oh, yeah. you have to have a real purpose and there's got to be a need for the product for you to venture into uh that which brings me to the sparrow hawk uh a different kind of design by you a different kind of tomahawk and every new tomahawk that you come out with is different in some way uh tell us about this yeah this is our first full tang tomahawk so this is the sparrow hawk in its uh carry system so you have a blade cover, a spike cover, and then there's a cover down here. And these are Kydex covers uh, connected with shock cord. And so you can wear it under your arm like this. Uh, I loop it with a paracord between my shoulder blades and it's accessible very quickly. But this is uh, my personal Sparrowhawk. Let me show a nice, clean new one, which looks better on camera. Um, but 
Yeah, the Sparrowhawk is our first full tang tomahawk, and it is the thickest full tang tomahawk on the market. So it, we call it the Sparrowhawk because it looks like a bird. It even has a, a hand-woven leather grip mm. wrap, which looks a lot like a bird nest. So it has bird-like vibes. But when you turn it, you know, the side profile is very distinctive, but when you turn it, uh, this is, uh, it starts out at five eighths thick, uh, inches thick at the uh, chopping region, wow. and then tapers down to about uh, a quarter inch, under a quarter inch thick at the base of the handle. So that shifts the center of mass far forward. Um, most full tang tomahawks on the market are made by stock removal from a set plate thickness. Um, so they'll usually have a constant thickness running through uh, the part. The one exception of that is the Winkler R&D Tomahawk from, uh, was it the Jack Carr series? Oh, yeah. List. yeah. Uh, so Winkler does uh, CNC mill that, but that starts out at three eighths thick. And then I think it tapers down to uh, a quarter inch or maybe uh, just under a quarter inch thick. Uh, maybe three sixteenths of the base. So they do that tapering uh, to keep the mass balanced forward. But, you know, three eighths thick is not as thick as this. This is over a half inch thick. And so what we found is uh, we can go really thin in this sort of neck region here. And that can keep the chopping blade projecting further out along with the spike side further out. But the overall length of the head is sub seven inches so it can be worn more comfortably under your arm um but it's still really thick really strong and that's been really uh interesting you know using it in batoning you know for utility um you have a lot of wide surfaces that you can strike against for splitting through wood um but yeah i mean we came up with this this was um probably two years ago i was on a a beach sketching tomahawks. So it's probably the only person in the world doing it, right? <laughs> right um, at that moment, yeah. Yeah, at that moment. And uh, yeah, I was looking at those medieval hurl bats, like uh, the Germanic throwing axes from like the, I don't know, they were using them from like the late 1300s to into the 1500s, like even into the age of gunpowder, they would have these all metal throwing axes that would usually have an ax blade, a top spike, a rear spike, and then the base of the handle was pointed. And uh, sometimes they even would forge a clip on them, like, a, you know, Spider Co. gets credit for the, the pocket clip, right, on knives. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, these medieval Germans had like a clip running down the length of the throwing axe so they could tuck these things into their belt or you cool. know, if they were wearing armor and then they could chuck these things. And there's not a lot of good history on it, but these things you can look up pearl bat or, or medieval throwing axe, you can see them up in museums, uh, but they were all metal for durability and they would be thrown. And according to the accounts, it would be sometimes thrown by men on horseback at a pike formation, you know, to disrupt people who are holding, you know, a pike before a charge um, or just use in combat. Like, hey, you know, if you don't have a firearm or a crossbow or something, you, know, you just hurl this ax at somebody before you close in. Yeah. Well, those were really interesting, but not wearable right? Because they're pointy all over. And yeah, you could tuck this pointy object up against your body, you're clad in armor, you know, it's right. not a big deal. Um, if you go to uh, Africa, they have the hunga mungas, those are distinctive throwing knives, some of them were even shaped like birds, like uh, the African hornbill bird. Um, and supposedly those were used as throwing weapons. Some of them may have been used for like currency and trade, but there's definite evidence with all these projected points that, you know, they would throw, it would revolve through flight and stick into target in many ways. So we're looking at those two, and we're also looking at um, Native American tomahawks. There were examples of all iron tomahawks where the whole tomahawk, it wasn't just an iron head on a wooden handle, it was forge welded to an iron uh, handle. So it was all metal, but wasn't a full tang tomahawk like you see on the market today. Mm -hmm. It had no handle scales. It was just 
basically think like a fireman, a, a fireplace poker, except it ended with like a small axe head on it. And mm. these things were almost always spike tomahawks, and they usually had a pointed base at the bottom. So I'm looking at all these designs, and I'm like, you know, if we're going to come out with our first full tang tomahawk, which people have been asking us to do, what's it going to be that's going to be distinctive from what's out there already on the market? What new capability is it going to provide? And this is pretty much what we wound up after many sketches homing in on was something that had a, a really a fairly long chopping edge that transitioned to this front point. So when you, you could thrust with it, and if you threw it, it could stick at greater impact angles. Uh, we also wanted a rear spike on it because spikes are very useful both in combatos and in the throw and in bushcraft. And we wanted a pointed uh, pommel on the base. And uh, you'll recall our Stingray Tomahawks, which also have a pointed base of hickory. Um, those, you know, work in the throw very well, but we wanted a metal uh, tip for this because you can also use it in bushcraft to baton. If you're working with small pieces of wood, you can place this up against it, talking like breaking down pieces of oh, wood, yeah. matchstick thin, and then use the thick base at the top to baton it because, again, it's very thick at the top. So it, it was just a fusion of these designs, you know, hurl bats, hungamungas, all metal tomahawks from America's frontier fused into this design. And we had to figure out how to make it carryable. So basically when you wear it under the arm, this is facing rearwards. Like basically your arm is here and you got the carry systems covering it all. Let me show you. I don't know if this is gonna come through on camera terribly well, but you got the blade cover Sorry, I'm positioning myself awkwardly on the kitchen table here with the studio. You got spike cover, and then you got pommel cover at the bottom. And you just wear that loop between your shoulders, right? And it hangs comfortably. And I've been wearing mine for, gosh, two months now, every day, and it's been fine. Uh, it's very accessible. Uh, you can draw it quickly. You can use it for utility cuts. You can throw with it. It throws really well because it has so many uh, angles of impact that it'll stick to target. Um, and it is pretty darn good at chopping. This is the heaviest tomahawk we've ever made. It weighs just under 18 ounces uh, because it's so short that it does have, because of the weight, it, it is a little less quick than like the Stingray or the Back Ripper. Mm -hmm. But recovery is pretty darn good because it's such a short handle. And that was another thing that we picked up on when we were looking at these historic all metal tomahawks. The handles were really short. Like usually they were overall length 12 inches, some of them as short as 10 inches. So we definitely think those were short to reduce the weight. Um, and shorter handles tend to throw better. Like the handle gets out of the way on rotation faster. So yeah, that's that's the sparrow hawk. So in a in a combative uh, use, the blade shape is very interesting because you're talking about the weight and how uh, because of the weight, which actually 18 ounces still isn't that much. Uh, no. But uh, with the extra weight, recovery is slower. But that top shape of the blade allows for instead of a returning chop, a returning thrust. Like a, yep, and, and also and, it extracts really easily. So like when you bury this into flesh and bone target, it slides right out. There's no beard to hang up at all. Oh, so yeah. as far as recovery, like it chops pretty quick. It's just like, this is a blur. You know, this is just, cause it's heavier. It takes a little bit more energy to, to get it going, but it's still nowhere near as sluggish as like a heavier, like think of an RMJ Tomahawk or a lot of the Winkler Tomahawks are pushing north of 20, 24 ounces, yeah. you know, 18 ounces is lighter. I'm not, you know, crapping on those companies. They make fine quality products or heavy duty tools, like, but they're focused a lot on breaching. Yes, we right. do not market these for breaching because I do not have any background in breaching. I don't feel well, credible to speak to it. For uh, just for people who might uh, need the information, uh, just talking with um, uh, RMJ. Uh, what's the gentleman's name? Ryan Johnson. Ryan Johnson. Uh, a yep. couple of years back, I asked him uh, how he got into making tomahawks, and 
and he had made a few, but then uh, they got in the hands of some special forces guys uh, early on in the uh, in uh, Desert Storm or uh, uh, Iraqi Freedom, yep. and uh, pe- and that people were using them to like break into uh, houses, you know, to breach doors, to breach yep. metal doors, to breach uh, vehicles, and destroy stuff to get into stuff. Oh, yeah. And uh, so a very kind of uh, he's a fascinating guy and it was a great conversation, um, but a very different uh, point of view or perspective or angle uh, of approach than Wingard wearables, uh, which, uh, you know, even including the, the the full tang tomahawk in your hand is, uh, you know, building weapons uh tomahawks as quick recovery weapons and by recovery i mean you can you can sling them around like they're barely there because they're nice and light yeah and i think that's like uh you know different design intents and that's the big thing like most people when they think about tomahawks they think oh you know they're all similar or you know one's just like the other and really you know reviewing tomahawks both historically and what you see on the market today they're more kind of like swords as a category of weapons. Like there's not one type of sword or one method of using a sword. Like there are swords that were used for hunting, for bushcraft, right? There are swords that were specialized like a small sword or a rapier, you know, strictly for combat. And so I look at Tomahawks historically and today as just a huge scope of designs with different specialties and applications. So. You know, making a tomahawk for breaching, that's probably not something we're ever going to do because you do need that weight for breaching. Absolutely. Um, there's a reason why they have to go, you know, 20 to push in close to 30 ounces on those designs because it's just a whole lot of, it's a whole different animal busting through and trying to chip out a murder hole in an adobe wall versus, you know, chopping wood and throwing you know, in uh, combatives or for recreation or for like flesh and bone combatives. Like these Tomahawks, our Tomahawk designs can be a lot lighter because we aren't burdening them with breaching capability. We have had customers come back and tell us things they've done. And it's like, well, I didn't design it for that. You know, just because it made it through, I'm not going to advertise like, oh, so-and-so, you know, broke down a door at a, you know, sketchy domestic situation, you know, it's like, uh, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm staying away from breach. I think that's a capability that is covered, you know, with Ryan at RMJ and also Winkler. Um, but yeah, that's their, they do great work, but yeah, check these out. These full tank Tomahawks, they, they don't have to be as heavy as the ones on the, you see on the market. Like if you, if you aren't interested in breaching, you're interested in more bushcraft, combatives and having something you can wear under your arm or keep accessible as a bedside implement sparrowhawk it can cover a lot uh i would imagine this was the one you were talking about uh this could easily take down a door i think yeah uh, yep. <laughs> all right um but the 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 sparrowhawk um when, when you're holding it up it's obvious when you look at it how all the tactical applications to it you got a spiky pommel you got a big giant spike on the back you've got that beautiful recurve blade and and uh and a, a point and by the way that handle feels so good in yes. hand that that basket weave uh but you were talking about this also say in bushcraft uh you mentioned you know making little kindling with the punio but like uh how do you how do you see that whole setup it a lot it looks like a lot of tools on the top for a bushcraft yeah. scenario so you can definitely chop this is probably our best chopping tomahawk because it is the heaviest um but it's also very sharp um and so we found you know that combination of, of high weight and sharp blade it processes wood and chopping pretty darn good i'm not saying it's as good as a hatchet right because hatchets are a lot heavier and more optimized but as far as the tomahawk goes this just in chopping wood does pretty darn well. You can also grip up here. So like the edge doesn't go all the way to the handle. Mm-hmm. It, it uh, blends out here so you can put your, your hand underneath. So you can do some knife-like like push cuts and utility cuts, but really the back end here, this spike, it comes to a chisel tip. It's not like needle sharp. Like it, it won't you know press up against your body and pierce you. It, it pierces through percussive impact. 
So you can use that to grub the ground or bury into the ground, wiggle it out, and use the flat side to drive a wooden stake into the ground. Uh, the Stingray does that too. The Stingray does it a little bit better because the, the spike is longer and the flat sides project out more. But the sting, uh, the Sparrowhawk still does that pretty darn well. This is like over a three inch long spike. So you do pre-tap holes for wooden stakes really well. And in some ways you can drive wooden stakes into the ground faster than a hammer pole tomahawk. Because that hammer pole tomahawk, you're just focusing that uh, you know small hammer face into the wooden stake to drive it into the ground. You don't pre-tap a hole. Oftentimes you miss impacts with a stake or you break the stake because of such focused impact. So, you know, using the flat sides of the tomahawk head can be used in percussive impact in that way. Um, but yeah, batoning's a big deal. Um, splitting through wood, the thickness really buys you that because you're over a half inch thick you know, when you place that blade on a piece of wood and you start batoning through, it has more of a splitting type wedge like you would mm. see in like a hatchet or a wood processing axe. So in that way, you know, we didn't have handle scales projected up in this region either. It's really yeah. streamlined for just splitting through larger pieces of wood. This is a, a very uh, cinematic um, I wanted to call it a knife, a very cinematic tomahawk. Like I could totally see this in uh, a movie like the raid or something like that i hope um, i hope that happens be oh, that would be cool advertising. The, the the one thing that i'd have to do is um make it silver so it's easier to see uh oh, through it, the... we'd polish it up for like yeah. uh, hollywood absolutely uh, <laughs> uh well how is it made i know that your um a lot of your different products are made in different ways um yeah, but all so, here in america how's this made so this is investment cast uh, 4340. And so um, our back ripper tomahawks are hand forged W1 tool steel. Our Empress tomahawks are sand casted high strength silicon bronze. Uh, when we got to the Stingray, we went with investment cast uh, 5160. 5160 is a very tough steel. It, it doesn't have large carbides in it. Um, and the Stingray was a very complex shape, like the inside of the eye has grooves in it and that sort of thing to bite into the wood when you hang it. Um, but the Sparrowhawk was even more complex, even though it didn't have an eye and a hole in it, it's much larger and its geometry is very three dimensional. And so we could not make that uh, economically via stock removal. Like mm -hmm. if you were to cut out of five eighths thick plate of steel, this shape, and you were to try to nest multiples of them in it, I mean, you would be wasting pounds of steel per part. Um, and it would cost you a lot in processing machining time to further remove the material as you're tapering it down. And it gets difficult for machine tools to cut to mill uh, smaller projected spikes like if you have any if you're cutting away too much material you can have the metal bend like the, the tool can yeah. bite it's just it's a, a nightmare so we went with investment casting um because we had success with it previously with the uh, stingray but it was pretty complicated so um there are not many edged weapons on the market that are investment cast. Well, what, very... what is what is that? I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you've yeah. mentioned it a few times, and I don't know what that is, actually. Okay, so if you think uh, sand casting, they can make a mold um, or an impression in sand. Like, you could take this and make an impression of it. Like, you could have a wax mass or even a 3D printed master impress it into a special kind of sand that holds its shape. And you can create two halves of that and sandwich it together. And then you have what's called a sprue or a runner. It's basically a, a channel. And so in that empty cavity, you mix the compounds that make your steel, melt it down, and the molten steel flows in and fills that cavity. And that's sand casting. And when we started with the Sparrowhawk, we initially went with sand casting for the prototype runs. But one of the uh, problems with sand casting is it is prone to surface pores. 
mm. which you can see up here. So this is my prototype at sand cast it. it. It looks, and the pores only show up on the side that's upwards facing. And this is, I, I put this thing through the ringer. It's a very strong part, but that is unsightly. And casting is an expensive process. Uh, even sand casting, which is more affordable than investment casting, you still have to have a, uh, a die to make the parts that you make the imprints out of. And the mm -hmm. die is machined out of, CN usually CNC out of aluminum and costs thousands of dollars. Well, with investment casting, that process, you have the die that makes a wax master part. So all that die does is makes basically what looks like a wax version of the metal of the sparrowhawk, of the part. And uh, that wax is then, they, they sort of adjoin the sprues, that the runners that flow the metal to the part. But then you can't just have like um, the flow of the molten metal going in. You have to have a sort of gas escape path because there are residues and gases and steam that can come off of the sand casting. Like, because you dunk this wax part in a, in a wet sand mixture and have it dry. And then you melt out the wax and you have the empty cavity and you flow it in. Does this make sense so far? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you can't just have the molten metal flow in and you're dumped and the part cools. No, it doesn't work out that way. You got to have uh, a, a gas escape path for hot escaping vapors to run off. And then you have to have, I believe they call it a riser. And it's a, an excess volume, which could in some cases be, you know, a third of your part of the metal in your part. And what that is is sort of the overflow. So they fill up all uh, these yeah. cavities in that reservoir in the riser as the part cools, as the molten steel solidifies, there is shrinkage, right? <laughs> and the more temperature gradient, the more severe the temperature difference is along the part, the shrinkage can be so great that it causes cracking. Um, and so when they make parts at a foundry, uh, they use what's called solidification models. They actually will uh, 3D model up your part um, and they'll play around with different locations and sizes of runners and risers and vent holes so that they mitigate against you know, cracking and voids and that sort of thing. And these solidification models are, you know, state of the art. They've been around, you know, thanks to advances in computing. But before that, casting had, was done just by experience. You know, you would try to do your best guess. And we're talking like in the, you know, early 1900s to, you know, the uh, mid 20th century, you know, casting would sometimes you would have parts that would have internal voids and, and cracks mm -hmm. and failures. And to this day, you'll hear people say, well, if the, a part is cast, that means it's brittle or it will be prone to failure. And that was probably true in the early 1900s when a lot of the you know understanding of how the solidification process can go out and how you mitigate against these defects, how you can do that. But now it's pretty well understood. And so they run solidification models on parts at the foundry to try to get you the highest yield of viable parts. Now, there's still rejections, right? So, you know, you cast, uh, say you cast 10 Sparrowhawks, some portion of them will have rejects, even with the solidification models and all the, the mitigation they do against defects, defects happen. And so those are fortunately very obvious when you have a void or a, a shrink crack, and that's a rejected product. But the ones that, you know, are uh, cast, cooled, solidified, they then get uh, heat treated, and then we receive them and do stock removal. And so thanks to casting, getting this part to near net shape, we wind up removing about an ounce of steel to get it finished. You know, that's the amount of resurfacing and grinding to put the final edge on it. Now, that's still time consuming. You're going through a lot of belts because it's heat treated um, yeah. steel, but it's still not near the amount of material being removed if it was stock removal. Right. Um, the alternative to that would be like um, 
die or drop forging where you have a piece of metal and it goes through different stages with you're trying to minimize the number of heats so you have multiple mold dyes that it goes to if you look up a uh, vaughn tool like they make a lot of the uh, cheap hatches you see at lowe's or home depot mm -hmm. uh, you can go on like how it's made and look up how they work and basically they source one piece of steel for just about all their tools and from that they form various axets the the drop forge or the die forge process is limited with the amount of geometric complexity you can get because each stage you go through you're getting it closer and closer to the final shape i'm not saying the sparrowhawk couldn't be made that way but it would be very difficult to shape say a cylinder of steel and have this part come out yeah and there's an advantage of investment casting it's got higher surface quality over sand casting but the complexity of it is just you have all this cool you're forming the final material in the part you know yeah um every knife we use today started off cast right they cast the ingot and then they did all this processing to get it into a sheet of steel or a plate that then they cut the knife out of you know or did forging with the knife uh, everything you, you you see in steel started out cast but with the sparrow hawk and with our stingray the casting process occurs very very close to get it to near that shape so in some ways it's a more streamlined process it's just very expensive and i think that's why you don't really see it often in the edge weapon market there are some steels that are going to also be less favorable for it um 4340 is a very tough steel very not you know significant carbide structure so it'll do well um some of the powder metallurgy steels that are coming out would if you tried to just cast those probably have enormous carbides and truly be brittle that's why they mm. went with powder metallurgy where you're melting basically little droplets and having it cool the carbides can't get huge if you have tiny tiny little droplets that are cooled you know they then hip it and press it into a billet you know but powder metallurgy costs a lot of money yeah. and the payoff of that is more in pocket knife type application where you want that combination of like 60 plus rockwell c and tough high toughness for that hardness but 4340 uh, and 4140 are both steels that have really high toughness um that's why you see them so commonly in like throwing knives, like nothing's more abusive than throwing a knife or, <laughs> yeah, or sure. tomahawks, you know, where you need more toughness than you need hardness, right? Especially a full tang tomahawk. I'll stop rambling. Does this, any of this make sense or did yeah, it go No, 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 it all makes sense. I just okay. want to ask you this before it, uh, uh, just part of the, the finishing process. You were talking about how you remove an ounce through stock removal. Uh, are you doing the grinding? No, or do you have not. I have a beautiful metal finisher. Oh, he, well, the setup's beautiful. If he's listening <laughs> yeah, to this, I, I'm not like hitting off. You're a beautiful guy. But yeah, he, yeah, his work is beautiful. But um, no, uh, we work with two different metal finishers in Pennsylvania. So one specializes in bronze. So he resurfaces our sand casted Empress Tomahawk heads. And sand casting has a rougher texture. So there's more material to be removed, but bronze is softer than steel, right? So we were originally going to work with him to do uh, stock removal or, or resurfacing on the Stingray, but he pointed out like the hardness of heat treated steel for his grinding setup was, was oh. just too far. So he recommended a buddy of his that you know they kind of adult tag team projects like they do a lot of a lot of their work is like resurfacing and and sprucing up like uh, 18 wheelers like trucks to get them all nice and shiny like when you're up in Pennsylvania the winter roads just degrade you know yeah. the surface finish terribly and these truckers take a lot of pride in their trucks so that's kind of their bread and butter is is doing you know resurfacing on those but the belts they use like um you know a typical knife uh belt like a is a two by 72 usually for the belt setup um the belts they are using for these i want to say they're 12 feet um, oh my god they're huge they're wow. huge and they and the wheels that spin the belt are like shaped like a turban like a to cool oh, yeah. and so there's no water being run you're not ruining the heat treat because the the belt surface area is enormous like um 
it's a completely different animal from a two by 72 set up in a garage. Like this is like beyond anything I would, you know, even consider doing myself. Um, so they have a multiple uh, setups. I think they were, they had a nine footer, maybe a 12 footer. Try, I may be wrong on the, on the links of belts, but they were huge. Um, and so, you know, they're able to resurface these parts, which are fairly high surface area um, very quickly. Uh, so that's been really great. It's still a time consuming process sure. removing that ounce of, of steel uh, just through grinding, but we've been pleased with the results. They've been great. Uh, part of your process, we've talked about this a lot. Um, well, your wife is a big part of, uh, of your process in terms of, uh, helping you, you know, brainstorming a coming up with the quill, uh, idea. And I know she weaves the handles on those, yep. uh, sparrow hawks. Uh, so a shout out to your wife. It was very nice meeting her at the, uh, at, at your booth and chatting with her a little bit. Um, how, how, how does the, I mean, so every, everything that you guys do, you hand finish every, every wind guard wearable comes through, uh, your shop and, and your hands are all over and your wife does some stuff too. And, uh, so how, how does that work into like your brand identity is what I'm, I'm trying to get that, at here. That gets tricky because it is like, uh, you know, we're, we're not, there's a lot of stuff we do that's hands-on, but there's a lot of stuff that we outsource. And so, you know, a lot of these guys aren't going to be comfortable with us coming in with, you know, a microphone and camera and filming them at their workplace. Like, <laughs> not interested in that. They're interested in the revenue from, you know, what they've been contracted to work on. So um, that part is uh, tricky. I mean, we look at it as everything we do is American made. You know, we work with various small businesses. Uh, way early on, we would try to do features with our uh blacksmiths back when we were working with, with two blacksmiths and they were camera shy uh and it was like you know yeah it wasn't really something that like why push someone in, out of their comfort zone you know to feature on social media when it's like man all i want to do is focus on the metal craft you know oh, oh wait, so, wait wait, wait. Uh, it's a tricky I, question i i think i think i didn't uh, ask the question right i wasn't really talking about uh, your awesome social media, by the way. I love your oh, videos. Yeah. Uh, I was talking more about the finishing work that you do on each one of your products. You you do the hafting on the tomahawks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, your wife does the weaving of the the basket weave for the handle on the sparrow hawk. They all come through. You do you make the sheaths and such. Yep. Uh, and and a lot of R and D goes into that because these require special. These are unusual implements they require special carry uh carry options what what i was getting at is how much of that finish work uh is is at the core of wingard wearables or is that something that uh you would happily outsource also oh i would i would happily outsource if i could but it can't. Yeah. i can't i i do think the kydex work uh, is something that can be outsourced i hate working on kydex it is a necessary evil because Kydex is incredible. Um, yeah. But I think a lot of knife makers that work on Kydex, that's, they would probably share the same thing. And, and every time you open up like a new, the news, it's microplastics, you know? <laughs> so I'm like, uh, I, I'm probably going to live forever now or, or my body will hang around forever. Um, so we are actually looking into uh, 3D printing of carry systems. And mm. so there's actually a Pennsylvania company, G3D Printables. We work with them uh, for prototyping. Like when we prototype up a design in CAD, we will get it 3D printed, right? We don't even have space in our house for you know multiple 3D printers and they're really good at it. Um, but one of the things that we want to investigate is additively manufactured carry systems. And we've been testing prototypes um, you know, for spike style carry systems, that's a bit simpler than like a carry system for like a knife sheath. Right. Um, but they've been holding up well. And while we were doing that in parallel, uh, Turner CNC actually came out with several 3D printed carry systems for knives. Yeah. And they were like 
chuck them on the ground. You know, the technology for additively manufactured plastics has come a long way. They've got some with like carbon fiber impregnated and they, they take hundreds of pounds of abuse. So we're interested in figuring out how to outsource the carry systems. But as far as the handles, I'm, you know, the handle wraps and the, the wood handles and hanging the tomahawk heads, I feel like I have to be involved in that because that's something that, you know, I've made hundreds of tomahawks over the years, each time you get better at it. Every batch, there's some technique that's done to either improve the processing, the efficiency, or the quality every time. I don't think I could like teach somebody how to do that easily. And I certainly couldn't trust someone to outsource it, right? Because it's such a yeah. niche thing. Yeah, yeah, I didn't, yeah, it does. And and I mean, part of, well, I know something you take great pride in, is how you hang these. Uh, I guess mm. this is not the best light, but uh, this one might it might come through better. But I mean, with the cross wedging and you know all of the thought that went into, especially this one, how how the head would fit uh, in the haft. Um, yep. I I I can see how that would be. Uh, you know, that's a personalized. Um, yeah. What what's acceptable too to uh, like because everything varies because it's done by hand. But what's within acceptable limits, you know, sort of the, it's hard to describe the judgment call that you make as a maker when you've seen and, and made dozens and dozens and, you know, even hundreds of some of the models. It's like, you know exactly how it needs to be and you know when one's off. Um, so I, I think we're always going to be uh, hands on with every product. It's just the carry systems, boy, if I had an easy button to outsource that, oh, I would do it. And I don't know if 3D printing is going to be the answer. Uh, we talk about like tooling costs, injection molded sheaths. Oh. oh, man. I mean, it's easily 20 grand for a plastic uh, injection molding hardware. Um, uh, that's you know, just so like the, the template, basically. Yes. Yeah, that's what you would basically in, uh, melt down the pelleted plastic and inject it into. So when you look at more a knife, you know, with their handles and sheaths or, um, you know, a lot of cold steel fixed blades have that sort of uh, injection molded sheath. But you look at the scale, yeah. the scope of, of how yeah. many they're making versus when you're a small business, it's like, yeah, it'd be nice to know that we could sell thousands of these things, but you aren't, right? Because yeah. you're small. Everything's bottlenecks. So you're making dozens at a time. 3D printing makes sense for that. At some point, if you grow into like your Mora knife or cold steel, then yeah, you got to adopt these extremely expensive uh, industrial practices. Right, because they at scale. Yeah, they, yeah this this don't. is a uh, 3D printed knuckle duster that I'm yeah. always showing off. I love this thing. Uh, but you know, my first introduction to 3D printing years ago at the library were these beautiful but brittle little incredible yeah. sculptures you know yep. and and having this and being able to wail on something over and over uh mm -hmm. and with no fear of it breaking is uh it's pretty amazing uh, yeah. so it's it's interesting to think that you could streamline your process uh through that route i mean like what i was saying in my intro uh that's part of what i love about your products like i keep saying like i've been hanging out with my daughters all weekend uh, the 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 reason I love your work so much is that there is that old world uh, solution. It's a it's a tomahawk and and it's in those materials, but but there's a lot of modernity that goes into it, especially into the research and the development and figuring out how to wear it in a in a modern. Yeah, oh, and we're we're hoping to do this year is improve our processes. Like one of the problems I would say we've had in the previous years is like you, you get tunnel vision on like, how do I make this product as perfect as possible, you know, with the processes, but you focus the processes only on that product instead of expanding your scope and being like, hey, how can I improve the processes I'm using now? Like hand pressing Kydex, that takes a, a lot of time, you know, band sawing, hand drilling them, all that stuff. Um, it just takes a ton of time. So one of the things we want to do this year is look at not just new products, um, but also new processes to streamline the way we make our current products, such as the carry systems and future products. Like one of the things we wanna get into is small fixed blade knives. Like, you know, not everyone can carry 
you know, uh, an almost foot long. Well, everyone could carry this, but you know, it takes a special kind of person to carry a big <laughs> knife, right? Yeah, yeah. But small fixed blades are hot, and that was yep. one of the advantages yep. of going to Blades Show was seeing so many uh, people talking about like, oh, this is the thing. It's like I love small fixed blades. My first yeah. knife I ever designed, like back in 2012, for myself was a small fixed blade, um, and it's like, all right how does Wingard wearables tackle that? Cause that's an extremely saturated market. And one of the things that's been interesting listening to the interviews you've had, like with Jack Wolf knives, like them getting into a small fixed blade and the approach they took kind of making a uh, fixed blade version of a folder was yeah. interesting. Yeah. And we, we saw a number of people talking about that as a, as a feature, like, Oh, we're going to come out with a folding knife and have a fixed blade version. I was like, huh, that's not how I would have approached it at all. So you get exposed to these different ways of, of thinking. But small fixed blades are going to be, uh, it sounds like they're going to increase in uh, output as far as what's going out on the market, but they're responding to the demand. Yeah, um, And we are thinking about getting into that and what processes we can do and designs to make it distinctive and have a unique capability. Oh, I'm um, as as uh, as they say, I'm here for it. I love small fixed blades. Obviously, I carry them all the time. Uh, I'm a daily carrier of uh, at, at certain times a day, multiple fixed blades. We were talking about the, uh, the how Fred Perrin's got all those tiny little knives. I keep one on the back of my work ID. Oh, yeah. I always but, got one. But the next small fixed blade, right? Oh, yeah. The micro pike, yeah. micro pike Gen 2. We're coming out with uh, the the batch. We had a small batch of Gen oh, 2s on, yeah. at Blade, but I wanted to show you this was Gen 1 right here, the skinny, ugly guy. It was uh -huh. uh, one piece of uh, 01 tool steel, and 01 it doesn't like to uh, move a lot when it's being forged. So uh, with this, we have 5160 wow. uh, forge welded to mild steel. And we got a much more pronounced uh, leaf blade, but look, it's just a small EDC fixed blade, right? Yeah, yeah. It's just on a 15 inch steel handle. <laughs> Love so it's that. like, you know, you can wear it in your pants comfortably, you know, but it's like, well, most people, when they see that, they were like, it's too unfamiliar, right? You gotta be similar, uh, but different. And that the micro pike is just, that's out there. Like there's nothing out there like that. Um, so we'll see. We're going to have a small batch of those dropping on the site probably in the next week or two. Um, but yeah, and I, I reckon when this video comes out, it'll probably already have been dropped. But yeah, cool. small fixed blades, hopefully smaller than this, you know? Yeah, we'll see. What's well, your Zach, favorite length of fixed blade? What, I, I, well, I love, uh, I mean, for everyday carry, like 3.75 to 4 inches uh in in blade length but uh you know but i have some that i like that are smaller uh, but that's my sweet spot right there what about uh, those like uh little lapel knives those thumb daggers and, and things oh, like when you're talking I, really I, small what length do you like yeah uh, exactly. like that's station nine isn't it yeah it is station yeah. nine i'd say about uh three inches overall okay. with uh with a with a three quarters inch grip or so, 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 so very strong jimping going, you know, like, so you, way. you'd say three inches is about your bare minimum for you. Yeah. 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 Okay. For a lapel, something that I would add a little Bob to and yep. okay. carry covertly That's on my world. missions, you know? Yeah, exactly. Well, Zach, we'll keep our eyes peeled for the uh, small fixed blade knives from Wingard Wearables. But before uh, before I let you go, yeah, let's see that one more time. All Here right, it let me is. Try to get this because I'm watching myself on camera. To try to get this uh, on there. Boy, the lighting, the glare. The, the, it's no, so it, it looks it looks great from over here. Okay, that's a beautiful sparrow hawk, full tang uh, tomahawk thickest, from Wingard the thickest, Wearables. Girthiest full tang tomahawk on the market. Girthiest full tank Sterile. tomahawk. Uh, you need it for combat. You need it for camp. You need it. Check it out. All right, Zach, it's such a pleasure always having you on the show. And thanks for coming on and telling us all about your Blade Show experience and the brand new Sparrowhawk. It's been a pleasure, thank, sir. Thank you, Bob and Jim. And you guys have a fantastic night. Thank you. Take care. The Shockwave Tactical Torch is your ultimate self-defense companion. Featuring a powerful LED bulb that lasts 100,000 hours, a super sharp crenulated bezel, and a built-in stun gun delivering 4.5 million volts. Don't settle for ordinary. Choose the Shockwave Tactical Torch. The KnifeJunkie.com slash Shockwave.
There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Zach Wingard of Wingard Wearables. Uh, on to talk about his Blade Show experience and the Sparrowhawk. It's always fun talking with Zach. Uh, go over to wingardwearables.com or check him out on Instagram and uh, watch these things as they develop. It's always exciting, uh, but also buy these things. Something we didn't talk about, one thing that... Uh, they do get into our bludgeons as well, and here is their wearable version of the uh, of a an Indian uh, war club. So very very cool. All the stuff they make there, interesting and unique. All right, thanks for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. Join us next week for another exciting interview, and Wednesday for the midweek supplemental, and of course Thursday for Thursday night knives. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time. Don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast